Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Is everyone enjoying Unite? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining my talk today. It's about monetizing on AR and uh, how to create compelling augmented reality experiences. Just, uh, I have a lot of content to share today, so I kind of want to get an idea of who's in the audience. Um, can you please raise your hand if you're a specifically a Unity developer? All right, cool. Majority of you guys in the room. OK, how many of you guys uh, actually create VR and AR projects today? All right. How many of you guys have actually tried the Meta headset? OK, cool. Awesome. So some of you, those who haven't, please come check out our booth. We're down here at the exhibit hall. And you, everything that I'm uh, sharing with you today will make a lot more sense uh, after you try on the Meta headset today. And so um, one last thing, in terms of all those who actually tried the Meta, how many of you actually heard of our spatial principles? OK, cool. Awesome. All right, great. Fantastic. All right, so a little bit about myself. Um, my name is David O again, and uh, I've worked in immersive technologies most of my career. Um, I worked at Ubisoft for over 11 years, and uh, one game th uh, that really uh, got me really motivated about VR and AR was this game called Fitness Evolved. And not just because you look really stupid <laughs> while playing this game, but uh, the big driver was that you would actually burn calories while working out, so that was one of the big drivers. And you know, a lot of a lot of the media picked it up because you know people were actually losing weight with the game. Uh, Humana Healthcare started making their subscribers actually play the game, and they would actually get rewarded like with movie tickets or or travel, but real world benefits based on a game. But it really dawned on me that we were really headed towards a direction, uh, you know, where this embodiment of your physical self actually being transposed and interacting with digital content. After Ubisoft, uh, I worked at Leap Motion, which is a hand tracking uh, technology controller. It's a small little device based on uh, two cameras, so I can understand depth with those two cameras. And it took pictures of these monochromatic images of 2D images of your hands. And the, the, the backbone of Leap Motion was the, the algorithm that understand what your hands are doing in 3D space. But I worked with this one developer, uh, Zach Kinsner. Um, who is now doing a lot of great things in VR and AR today, but he comes from a UX background. He originally created Fragmental for iOS and Android, for mobile. And of course, that interaction with interacting with 3D shapes didn't really translate really well on a 2D screen. And when I, when I actually convinced him to come to, uh, do some stuff for Leap Motion, it actually found its home there. It was actually one of the most popular games on the Leap Motion platform and also really resonated in the, with the VR community. And while working at Leap Motion, I started doing a lot of stuff in VR. And with VR, I really understood what the meaning of presence was. That's a, that's a word kicked around a lot, of course, with VR. You guys are all experts because you guys work in Unity, and a lot of you are even VR developers. So I don't need to explain what, what presence means. But one thing that's really interesting about the word presence is the simple fact that it refers to a, you know, something very spiritual. Mindfulness meditation uses the word presence to actually understand being very conscious of oneself. So it's interesting how this word that's being used for the vocabulary of, of spirituality then gets translated into this technology, because this technology is very powerful. And of course, VR has been around for a long time. This is from Cyber Edge magazine, uh, from Ben Delaney. He, was, uh, he, he published this editorial. And you know, VR was around from the beginning. You know? they, they also had hand tracking, which is you know, about five times the cost of what it is today. The graphics obviously wasn't there. That lady is not really having that much of a great time. I don't believe it. You know, I don't even think the headset is turned on. But you can see that you know, VR was in the lexicon of that time. And of course, it's become commoditized. That's my niece and nephew, Isabella Marley. Marley's wearing a Samsung gear. And uh, you can see that even with a mobile phone today, you can get transported and really experience presence. Now, uh, some of you, of course, know that uh, you know, the Sword of Democles was part of the de Mother of All Demos by Douglas Engelbert, one of the first VR, AR experiences today. And this experience was really interesting because it was tethered, and it was tethered to a ceiling. And it was partially, you can actually see through the display. So it was also the first AR headset. So it's not only the first AR uh, headset, but also the first VR headset. And in 1968, it was interesting that it was called, uh, named the Sword of Democles. If you don't know the story of Democles, it's a mythos around uh, Democles, who was ruled by the king Dionysus. And Dionysus had granted Democles a wish. And that wish was, you could be king for a day, with a caveat. 
And that caveat was there would be a dagger suspended by a horsehair as he sat on the throne. And the real takeaway from that story is even if you're at the greatest length of power, there's always fear involved being part of that power. And to quote Stan Lee, with great power comes great responsibility. And so even early on, Douglas understood that the power of this technology can really transform humankind. And it was almost in a way very spiritual in the sense of that name. So this, that's Steve Feiner right there. Steve Feiner is an early advisor and mentor for, for Meta. Um, he was the professor that Miron Gribitz, our CEO and founder, uh, went to school at Columbia and, and was taught and mentored by Steve. But Steve is known as like the godfather of AR because he created Karma. And Karma is an acronym for knowledge-based uh, augmented reality maintenance assistance. And it was the first time where Steve Feiner actually had a hypothesis that, hey, humans can be more productive with this technology. And even early on, 1993, that's a heads-up display, see-through optical display, where you see these little white triangles there. That was made by Logitech at the time to understand spatial uh, uh, understanding, to give you spatial positioning. And then you actually see how those red lines indicate how to actually fix this printer. So this was happening in 1993. And with that being said, I'm going to share with you a little video about what Meta is all about. I just tried the Meta development kit and I was completely wow. blown away. The best augmented reality heads up display that I've experienced. There was something, something special about this experience that you can't, you can't quite articulate. I mean, you just have to do it. It's definitely here, and it's definitely real. I'm emotional because I've, I've never seen a product like this since the Macintosh. I was really, 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 really impressed. It blew me away. I didn't think that this, the, the graphical look was going to be that high resolution, and it really, it's amazing. You can almost, like, taste it. It's great. I'm blown away, you know. That was really amazing that I could just, like, grab something, pull it around. The Meta 2 comes closer than anything I've seen to what I imagined that augmented reality would eventually be. To see that for the first time was, was really an extraordinary thing and truly a glimpse into the future of exploration, I think. What I just tried was so unbelievable, so much further along than anything I could have expected, that it upsets me that I can't literally leave the hotel and bring this technology with me. If, if you're interested in developing for AR, like this is the device. Jump on the bandwagon and start developing. All developers should definitely come to Meta. They are the future, they are the best. Now is where you establish yourself as a pioneer for where the industry is gonna be going and uh, make a name for yourself, so. Go ahead, get the Meta, it's awesome. I think the time has come for a much more natural machine, a machine that leverages the power of neuroscience to be an extension of our senses instead of going against them. We're no longer confined by the dimensions of the screens on our desks or the rectangles in our pockets. Instead, we can have the whole world as our desktop background. If you've been thinking about developing for augmented reality, now is the time to finally make your dreams come true. Cool, so this is the meta. If you haven't checked it out, please go downstairs and check it out at the exhibit hall. Don't leave right now, though, because I want you to hear the presentation. But um, you know, the Meta headset, we offer the widest field of view than any a AR headset. It's 90 degrees field of view. We also offer hand tracking. Um, it's inside out slam tracking itself. Um, of course, you know, this is still a development kit. So this is the perfect time for developers to jump on board and start really understanding what AR is all about. If uh, some of you had went to last night's keynote, you can uh, remember Clive talking about the CMO of Unity, talking about if you're a Unity developer today, you're an AR developer. And that's because Unity makes it so easily, easy to get onto an AR experience by using their platform. And of course, we offer a Unity SDK, and it's very easy for you to actually create an AR experience right off the jump. And so the, the crux of my presentation is to really make compelling experiences with AR. But before I do so, I want to explain to you how big of a market AR is and is going to be in a very short amount of time. Um, how many of you people have seen this information from DigiCapital? Please raise your hand. Okay, cool, awesome. So, um, you know, in, in four years' time, if you look at the growth of AR, we're looking at close to $85 billion in revenue in 2021. And in, uh, in, in compared to VR, 
which is that uh, baby blue color, you know, you're, you're about $25 billion. So you can see a huge opportunity of growth, but it's specifically around AR because AR is going to, um, you know, really infiltrate and understand how people can be more productive. Now, some of the people have probably seen some of the numbers kicked around early on from digital capital around VR. And you might say, well, it wasn't that big in terms of content. It was actually a lot less in terms of hardware. But actually, if you look at the numbers, they're actually right on point. So the actual execution, the specifics may differ, but the actual revenue and opportunity growth for developers is actually there. So we're looking at a behemoth. We're looking at a, a, a huge opportunity, a, a huge blue ocean for, for developers to really, um, really capitalize on this growth of this industry. Now, I want to give you a comparison of VR developers early on who really jumped onto this new technology. And I want to share with you some anecdotes. Um, this is Servios. Um, they, they created this game uh, around um, you know, a science fiction first-person shooter world. And uh, they made some headlines last year because um, they raised $50 million from MGM. Hollywood Studios are very, very proactively courting those guys. And also, um, uh, they were actually one of the first games to reach a million dollars in revenue after one month. And that was really exciting for the VR industry. Now, I knew these guys really early on. They actually were just finishing up USC. They finished up this project called the Holodeck. And I uh, actually introduced both of them to some of the early advisors. And uh, I remembered hanging out with them at this Airbnb. And, and James was specifically really excited about how esports can revolutionize VR. And he really kept to that mantra. And, and I actually introduced him to Emmett Shear, the CEO of Twitch. And they really got to going about how you know, VR can then become the predominant player for esports, which is kind of cool. And uh, another anecdote of early people who jumped onto VR, that's uh, Patrick Hackett and Drew Skillman from Tiltbrush. Um, I, I worked with them early on when they were actually um, uh, working for Tim Schafer's company. And uh, they actually uh, were creating a lot of really cool things. And they even did some really cool things around Leap Motion and VR called Plasma Ball. We were interacting with this really cool uh, brain object that would actually have trails. And uh, I was talking to Patrick and Drew and really telling them, hey, you guys really start off on your own because they kind of felt hindered. But you know, they recently got acquired by Google. And uh, they're doing some really incredible things with Tiltbrush, where artists all around the world are actually using their platform to actually create some fascinating things. But again, their passion delved from one thing, which is around creativity. And that was really interesting because they're really passionate around creativity and extending that into VR. Uh, these are my friends, Alex Schwartz and Devin. They're from Alchemy Labs. They also got acquired by Google. Um, and uh, you know, they, they also, I met them really early on. I was actually doing some early work for Unity. And when they were uh, really creating one of the first early indie games called Ah, you know, it was a really cool game where it was an endless faller and you were trying to avoid different shapes. And uh, I worked with them early on, and they were really passionate about future forward tech. I also work with them a lot with Leap Motion. And uh, of course, they created Job Simulator, which was this game in VR where you're doing menial tasks because we need more of that in our lives. Um, but anyways, uh, I met with them yesterday, which is kind of funny because I always ask my friends who, if their companies got acquired or if something really uh, interesting happened uh, with them financially. I always ask them, like, hey, what was the first thing that you bought, right? Because um, I'm kind of weird like that. And uh, Devin explained to, to me that he bought a, a Model X, you know, a Tesla SUV. And then Alex, you know, he said he didn't buy anything, but he was really perplexed by this image that I was going to show in this presentation because it was like there's this watermark called Getty Images, and they never approved it. And the backstory of it is, is that they're at South by Southwest, and, and they were brought into this fireside chat, and uh, they realized they were the fireside chat, and they had to make up stuff on the fly to give this hour-long presentation. But they took a whole bunch of photos after their fireside chat, and they just thought that was really weird. But you know, the thing about VR and why it's so difficult to actually you know, make revenue today is that, you know, just to give you an idea, Facebook had earmarked over $500 million for content. And however, you know, there's not enough Oculus, there's not enough install base to really promote that. And that's because games are very expensive, but also there's a very high quality bar while making games. Everyone knows how to, everyone's played games, grew up with games, so people already have intentions of what a good game is. And when I worked in game development, I'd always hear this, you know, hey, it wouldn't be great to make this endless uh, big physical universe and you can run around, shoot people, do whatever you want. I'm like, yeah, you want to make GTA, you know, like that costs, you know, several hundred million dollars to make. But, you know, that's, that's very interesting in the sense that, you know, games, you know, the average cost of a VR game on Steam is 25 bucks. And of course, you, know, you can look it up online. There's a lot of research around it, breakdowns of how much it costs to make a VR game. It's very expensive. And of course, there's one thing that you can capitalize today with AR right now. 
and that's the enterprise. And not this enterprise, but the enterprise in the sense of business. Uh, enterprise is known for um, any company that has over 1,000 employees, and with enterprise, they're really focused on three factors, either increasing productivity, increasing market share, or reducing costs. And so for the enterprise, as long as you make an experience that they can measure on actually reducing the costs of a predictive function, like if you were to able to save a company a million dollars a year, they would spend up to you know, a third of that, up to uh, you know, $300,000 to invest in a particular project. I'm just giving you those numbers just so you can understand scale and what enterprises are willing to pay for AR. And I know this because most of the Fortune 500 companies, all the Fortune 500 companies are actually customers of Meta. I talk with them on a regular basis to understand their pain points. I actually work with developers to make, play matchmaker. And a lot of these projects are very interesting because a lot of these companies have big R&D budgets and they've been doing AR for a long time. But I'm gonna give you three verticals that uh, people have been talking about you know, really reinvigorating AR that really makes sense for us. Uh, because you know, I've been experiencing from the feedback is auto. Automo auto is a huge industry and a huge vertical that's been in decline with sales year after year for the last several years. But at the same time, uh, a lot of companies are actually using our AR headset and AR headsets to actually uh, even design heads-up displays. Heads-up displays are going to become a regular feature in cars. Um, I was hanging out with Robert Scoble in, in Vegas last year, and Mercedes had loaned him a Mercedes that was self-driving and had a really awesome heads-up display. And it really got me thinking, like, this is coming super fast. And uh, also another industry that's going to be really uh, change is retail. This is probably not the best example of AR, um, but with a, with a, with a see-through display, imagine all the different, uh, uh, different ways that you can interact with the shopping experience. And of course, healthcare. Healthcare, there's, there's a lot of uh, different institutions and hospitals that we're directly working with right now to really understand augmented reality and how to self-assess yourself, but also change the way the healthcare uh, is, is practicing with technology today. They need something very ster sterile. They also need a technology that's very usable and very uh, accessible to a lot of people. And of course, we offer hand technology around that. So with enterprise, instead of you know, you know, you're making $25 per game, you could, make, you could charge up to hundred, hundreds of dollars, if not thousands, per seat of anyone using your AR application to solve a problem in AR. So it's a great time to actually start developing for AR now because it's so new. And um, just to give you some example of some of the philosophy around Meta, I'm going to share with you uh, my personal antidote of what this actually means. So humans have always wanted to imprint and affect the physical world. And we know this from cave paintings in the past, and we know from the Renaissance and how people wanted to actually uh, understand how to present three dimensions on a 2D piece of paper. And of course, uh, now translating that into 2D screens, and then 2D screens then became mobile. This is an Uber driver. This is horrifying, uh, but you could tell like the passenger was probably pr really present at the time. And what we're doing is really understanding how the brain works and uh, then translating that because we're 3D creatures and we want this technology to be extensions of who we are. And we know 500 years from now, if we're, we're stuck in this paradigm of hun being hunched over in front of a monitor and keyboard, we know that on the evolutionary scale, we probably won't turn out right. And we definitely don't want to be part of this future where we're closed off from the world. And we definitely don't want to be part of this future closed, not, but being part of the world, but still being unfocused and being very mindful of your environment. This is Pokemon Go. We understood the importance and the need and the, the hunger for AR because you know, they released last year. And even in a short amount of time, they raised a billion dollars on this platform. So you know AR is something that people have really want, and even from poor executions of this experience. Um, just to let you know, this family got hit by a car after this photo was taken. <laughs> Rest in peace. Uh, so the, what, what does this all mean? Well, you know, I, I use this anecdote a lot. We're, we're kind of in this crux, this crossroads of where uh, in, in 1884, you know, we, we actually had the electric engine. And we, in, in eight, two years later, we had the combustible, you know, fossil fuel burning engines of gasoline. Now imagine how different the world would be if we actually invested in electronic technology today. It would probably be a totally different world. And I personally believe it would be for the better. And we're in this crossroads today where we have this technology 
that we know is very powerful, that can be scary and detrimental if not used properly, and we want to do it here at Meta around neuroscience. We actually want to really understand actually how the brain works and actually how the brain actually uh, consumes information to have this technology work with us instead of against us. Um, the man leading the charge on our end is Stefano Baldassi. He was an acclaimed professor uh, in Italy and then a Stanford professor, and he came to join Meta, and we had the biggest neuroscience team than any AR or VR headset company to really focus on how the brain works and how to hack it to actually extend this through our optics and through our software. So with that being said, I'm going to share with you guys three different videos about what these, we've, what these principles and guidelines that we live by. And uh, um, it's definitely uh, uh, open up for discussion because we want developers to actually challenge us while using these neuroscience principles to make better experiences. The first spatial interface principle is called Think Spatial. And it originates from this idea that in the past, because of the screen size limitation of older form factors, we've had to squeeze a lot of information into it, which means that we had to invent things like menus, buttons, icons, and pointers. However, in the real world, we don't use those things to interact with our environment. Instead, we place content, be it 2D or 3D, and tools spatially around us, around the users. So I could put my pens over here, my remote over here. Tools tend to be 3D. Why do we advocate that that's how we also build our 3D user interfaces in AR with tools around and content around? It's because in 2011, Kravitz published in Nature Reviews Neuroscience that there are two pathways to the visual system. The first pathway starts in the uh, retina, goes back to V1 and into the medial temporal lobe in the center here. That's the object recognition pathway. That handles questions of what am I looking at? Traditional operating systems have just been built for that one pathway. When I'm looking at icons and menus on my phone and abstract uh, metaphors, I'm constantly object recognizing. But there's a second pathway. This pathway has been neglected by traditional computing interfaces. And it's called the HAL pathway. It starts in the retina, goes back, and now it travels on the top of the cortex. This pathway handles questions of where am I in my environment? How am I grabbing and interacting with the environment? And things like visual working memory. By spatializing information around us, we're engaging with that second pathway and making computing a lot more efficient because it's leveraging more of our innate wiring. Thank you. So the big takeaway from the first principle is that we understand the what. If we're looking on a 2D interface and see a whole bunch of icons, we understand the what, the what, the what. But we don't understand the how and the where. You get it? We're not understanding a whole aspect of our brain, which can be very interesting if we're thinking that that's the right way to interact with technology. The second spatial interface principle is called minimize abstraction or design tools with volume and affordance. What does this icon mean to you? And how about now? In the first position, it might look like a plus symbol or add something. In the second one, it might look like a subtract symbol or close a window, remove something. How about this one? What does this icon mean to you? Do you know how to use this tool or how to engage with it? So this is an eraser icon from Photoshop. Let's look at another example of an eraser. Here it is. This eraser does something very different than this icon. It provides visual characteristics or what we call affordances that tell the brain how to interact with it. So there's this nook, this 3D nook around which tells the hand how to grasp it. There's a flat scrunchy area below that tells uh, the mind that if it's applied with force against a uh, flat area with some erasable text on it, it would probably erase that. So without any learning curve, without any manual, we know how to use this 3D object, this tool. And that's simply the way we're advocating uh, to build them in AR. The neuroscience behind this was discovered by Professor Rizzolatti 
and University Department in 2001. He discovered that in the area by the motor cortex, this is the area that sends signals to the hand and the rest of the body on motor commands or how to move in the world. By the hand area, there's an area called F5. F5 looks at these 3D visual characteristics in the world and reverse engineers them into a series of motor commands on how to grasp or how to interact with them. So with no learning curve, in a very intuitive fashion, you've trained your user how to use a tool. That's the power of minimize abstraction. Thanks. So that's pretty cool in the sense that the F5 part of your brain can reverse engineer anything that you see instantaneously. That's a trip, right? That's crazy. And I think that's really relevant today considering that you know, we've learned so much more about the brain in the last 10 years than the history of mankind. Just in the last 10 years, we learned more about the brain than we have in the, all, the history of man. And really, we haven't really explored how this technology affects the brain and how the brain affects this technology. This last principle I'm going to share with you, um, I'm going to bring it up. How many times have you placed a photograph, say, of your family vacation inside of a folder over here and lost track of where that folder was? Was it inside of folder A or B? And was that inside of root folder A? It's very easy to get lost inside of this sea of abstract symbology. That's not how our brains work necessarily. Now, some people say, well, use voice, but it's very easy to forget the name of that photograph. Therefore, we advocate to place objects in your real environment, much like we currently place them today. So I can place my brain in one part of my environment, I can place my Rubik's Cube in another, my MetaTube box over there, and spatial memory evolved just fine to help me retrieve those objects. It knows somehow how to retrieve them very naturally and effectively. How does this work? The Mosers in 2005 got a Nobel Prize for discovering what are called grid neurons. Grid neurons localize yourself relative to a map of your environment. It's that simple, it's that natural, and that's why we're advocating placing objects in this very natural way we've evolved with. Thank you. Awesome. So if you guys want to check more about our spatial principles, please check us out online. Please email me directly if you say, hey, I have questions about the spatial principle and how to make this particular uh, interaction that I want to create. Um, and also, you know, add to that. We're expecting developers like yourselves to really educate us at the same time, to challenge us while building these experiences going forward. So thank you so much for coming to my talk. Um, I'm going to open up for questions. We have a limited amount of time, but there are two Microphone's right there if you guys want to ask questions. No questions? Cool. Hey, thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>